Member Pronouns, and I am Director of Engineering at the American Civil Liberties Union. I think we can all agree that 2020 has been an intense year. There's a global pandemic forcing everyone to rethink long-held strategies around schooling, voting, healthcare, and everything in between. We've also seen a resurgence of public attention on racial justice, immigration, voting rights, and many other social justice campaigns. And if that's not enough, there's a highly anticipated and highly contentious election just around the corner. It may feel like a lot right now, but the fact is that these movements, campaigns, and elections are being fought and won and sometimes lost all the time every day. The ACLU has been fighting for civil rights and civil liberties for a century, 100 years of defending America's people against powers that attempt to strip our rights away. 100 years but our online presence and digital outreach is much younger and constantly growing. I'm here today to talk to you about how my team at the ACLU leveraged the Jamstack model to support an incremental and flexible approach to web development. But before I explain our approach, it's important to understand who we are and the challenges we face as a multi-issue organization with a long history and a growing online footprint. It often comes as a surprise to many that the ACLU is a nonpartisan organization. Our mission of protecting and advancing individual liberties and the rule of law is true regardless of who sits in the White House. We act on the principle that no one is above the law, and we will challenge those abuses of power that undermine our democracy. But I'd like to start off by acknowledging this man's role in bringing me here today. Immediately following the 2016 presidential election, and again, when the Muslim ban was announced just a few weeks into Trump's presidency, many Americans began to realize what Trump's vision for America meant for our civil rights. And many of them turned to the ACLU for guidance on what they could do and how they could help. Our site traffic surged overnight, and the outpouring of financial support allowed us to double our budget and staff up quickly to prepare for what had already begun to be an incredible fight. In the year following the 2016 election, we greatly increased our capacity to take on more court cases. We launched a new grassroots organizing program, and we began strengthening our own internal structures. And just to give you a sense of the scope of our work over the past four years, in August, we marked our 400th legal action taken against the Trump administration. This rapid growth of the ACLU also included building out a dedicated product and technology team that could focus on bringing technology expertise and product vision in-house. Prior to this time, we followed the path of many nonprofits. We relied on a major CMS for our primary website and outsourced most other digital experiences to third-party agencies. Over the years, as our online presence grew and we asked more of our website, our CMS grew with it adding new content types, plugins, custom integrations, and third-party scripts. And by the time the product and technology team formed in 2018, it was also time for a redesign. On the other end of the spectrum, every new campaign microsite meant a new agency contract and a new project built from scratch using a wide range of technical solutions and frameworks. Contracting with design agencies allowed us to move quickly and respond rapidly, but it left us with a patchwork collection of one-off microsites and digital artifacts, none of which shared information with each other or our primary website. This pattern also left us with few resources for maintaining these sites after the contract ended and the initial campaign moment had passed. This ecosystem was a natural result of practices that made sense for us for a long time. After all, we are an organization of litigators. Our bread and butter is protecting civil rights in the courtroom and a small, unified application was a lot more manageable for the size of our organization and team. But our organization has since doubled, and our relatively recent foray into digital organizing and online fundraising meant that our systems needed to adapt, and we needed a strategy that would work for our growing digital footprint and somewhat unique situation. As a multi-issue organization, the ACLU handles cases across a lot of different issue areas. What you see on the screen is just a portion of the issues we've covered as an organization. And our website supports decades of court case documents, guides to understanding your rights, press releases, research reports, and more recently, it includes thousands of blog posts written by our staff attorneys, our organizers across the US, and many civil rights leaders both within and outside of the ACLU. 
the vast landscape of content and the importance of making that content accessible to all Americans cannot be overstated. In addition to the breadth of issues and content, we are also a rapid response organization. As we've learned over the past few years, Trump can tweet in the morning and we'll have a new campaign on our hands by the afternoon. We needed to build a system that could handle all of this. But with a brand new team and 100 years of historical context, where do you begin? Our very first project as a new team wasn't an attempt to overhaul a long-lived CMS and the well-established systems that power our online fundraising. Team building takes time and intention. And coming into a 100-year-old institution, we knew there was deep historical context we simply wouldn't have at the outset. So instead of taking on a full redesign and potentially massive architectural overhaul, we identified a small project where we could potentially gain some traction as a new team and test out a few new technologies along the way. In addition to the usual product goals around engagement and conversions, we also had some lofty technical goals. We wanted to see if we could produce small reusable microservices and begin to chip away at the dual monolithic and cluttered one-off ecosystem that had begun to evolve. On the surface, what the district allowed the user to see exactly how their congressional district boundaries had changed over time, which of their neighbors' votes had been aggregated with their own. These boundaries are crucial to our electoral system. Sometimes the boundaries make sense, and sometimes it's very clear that something else is at play. Under the hood, what the district gave us the opportunity to test out new front-end frameworks, establish our first open API to feed data to our front-end, and even experiment with Lambda functions for generating custom share images based on our congressional district shapes. Perhaps more importantly, we use this project as a test of the Jamstack approach. Some of these designs and technologies we kept and iterated upon, some we did not, but the knowledge we gained helped shape the approach for our future work. As I mentioned, one of the outcomes of this project was our first open source API a service that returns geographic boundaries of U.S. congressional districts extending back nearly 100 years for any location in the U.S. Since that launch of What the District over two years ago, we've used those same congressional district boundaries to provide the basis for a point and polygon lookup service. This later service, built into our second open API, the Elections API, has since been used on our core ACLU website, as well as multiple campaign microsites and special projects. This lookup service has allowed us to deliver targeted district level information to our users based on their address, should they choose to enter it, or any other point location in the United States. And this includes not only the basic information about legislators who are representing you in the House and Senate, but also how their votes on congressional bills stack up against the ACLU's core values and mission. But reusability was not the only win. By decoupling our front end and back end and developing small reusable services, we've made it possible for developers to explore new tools, evaluate new hosting strategies, and make quick targeted updates when new solutions are discovered. We've increased development speed by templatizing our front end stack and building shared UI components. And we've put build strategies in place that allow for easy continuous deployment. If you've followed a similar path, and by virtue of being at this conference, I think it's safe to assume many of you have, you know that there are absolutely challenges to this approach. Incremental stack changes to a single website can lead to complex routing configurations, and introducing any new architecture will come with a learning curve for everyone involved. But by adopting a flexible and iterative approach, we've been able to chip away at a major site redesign one section at a time, while still having cycles available to respond to last minute campaigns and the sudden shifts of public attention including those major moments that we've seen in 2020. To give you an example of how we've been able to reuse our existing services and build upon the lessons we've learned through our iterative and incremental approach, I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, Alison Abreu Garcia, to walk you through a very recent and very timely campaign project called Let People Vote. Hi, I'm Alison Abreu Garcia. I'm part of a team of engineers, designers, and product managers at the ACLU that build digital tools and resources to inform and engage the public about the ACLU's work. Voting rights is one of the many issues that our organization has worked on for decades. The ACLU's Voting Rights Project was established in 1965, the same year the Historic Voting Rights Act was signed into law. 
55 years later, we filed hundreds of lawsuits and continue to fight for the rights of all Americans to vote. We knew we were going to build out something on our website about voting leading up to the 2020 election, but we never could have predicted what that would look like at the start of this year. The pandemic highlighted the importance of mail-in and early voting. Five states already conduct their elections almost exclusively by mail, and a majority of other states had the option to request an absentee ballot. But there are many states with eligibility rules that create barriers for people to vote. We called on Congress to increase federal funding for elections administration and to mandate universal access to no excuse vote by mail and a minimum of 14 day early vote period. We filed lawsuits in the states highlighted in this map. We wanted to build a tool that would feature these cases and help people navigate these rules and procedures to make a voting plan that was as safe, accessible, and secure as possible wherever they were registered. To start, we reflected on past sites to see what we could reuse. For the 2018 midterm election, we built the Jamstack site. This site was largely powered by our elections API, which drew data from a multitude of sources to offer information about ID requirements, polling place lookups, voting re records of members of Congress, and important election dates. There are many aspects of the site that were still relevant to the 2020 election that we would be able to draw from. But this election is also different in a number of ways. We needed to give much more detail to information about how to vote in the context of COVID. We also needed to be able to quickly update that content as cases were rolled and voting requirements changed. Since our 2018 voting site, we had built a number of new internal tools. Last year, we launched a new headless CMS for some of the sections of the site that we redesigned and moved on to the Jamstack, as Miranda mentioned earlier. We decided that building new content types within this existing system would be the fastest way to put the voting content into the hands of editors, allowing the production and uh, allowing the product and tech team to focus on the user experience and front-end engineering. It was a system our content team was already familiar with, and we had an established pattern for the CMS's API and for building front-ends that pulled content from there. Taking this approach meant that we had a back-end ready to go within a day. We also had some new tools on the front-end. When we found ourselves needing to use the same UI and functionality across our sites, such as our navigation, we built a shared component library. One example of a component that we'd be able to use is what we called our scheduler. During our end of year fundraising campaign, we needed to switch between different messaging and donation forms at specific times and wanted to reduce the need for manual updates when we knew the timing in advance. The Let People Vote required similar functionality for displaying upcoming dates related to the election and ensuring we weren't showing irrelevant information after elections had passed. We also have a starter template to quickly generate front ends for new projects. It loads the component library along with another other, a number of other common packages, settings, and patterns we use. We used our starter template to create the front end of our new voting site and connected this to our CMS. We focused on the primaries for our initial launch. And we were able to get the site up within a few weeks. Here's what the landing page looked like. It included a dropdown to select your state, a video about voting by mail, an overview of our cases, and a pledge to vote. Once the site was live, we started on the next phase for the general election. A lot of the structure is similar in terms of what milestones there are leading up to the general, but we wanted to provide a more detailed we wanted to provide more detailed information about voting by mail. We also needed to include resources our affiliates were providing about state-specific elections and rights. The content was continually evolving. Taking an iterative approach to this site also allowed us to make adjustments to the user experience based on feedback from our initial launch of the primaries and the shift from messaging about national litigation to state-based voting plans. We adjusted the design of our landing page and navigation to emphasize our state pages. Using our headless CMS, we were able to quickly add new fields to the back end so content entry could begin in parallel with the front end development. As lawsuits were won, we added a way to mark them as such. As new ways to engage arose, we added an actions panel to direct people to local and nationwide ways to get involved. Our 2018 voting site was largely powered by our elections API, which also feeds into several of our other sites, including scorecards, a place to look up who your members of Congress are and how their voting record aligns with the positions the ACLU takes. As part of this project, we updated our scorecards to indicate who is running for re-election. We're also exploring ways of bringing in these scorecards into Let People Vote as a resource. 
Had we built scorecards in a monolithic way, this would have been very challenging. Using the Jamstack makes it easy to connect to multiple data sources and share those data sources across projects. As Rhonda mentioned earlier, the Jamstack allows us to try new technologies, particularly for campaigns that we know we can eventually archive and stop maintaining. Let people vote was a good opportunity to explore a new full static mode with our static site generator. We were pleasantly surprised by how fast our site was. In fact, it was actually too fast. When you navigated from state to state, the page load was so instantaneous, it wasn't always clear that a new page had loaded because some states shared similar dates and guidelines. We had to adjust the design and content above the fold to show a more visible change. It was a good problem to have, and we are now going to explore moving some of those other front ends into full static mode. It's also been a great opportunity to learn about how we want to release content. In some cases, we may want to stage a large amount of content for simultaneous release. In other cases, we might want to make small updates as we get them and have them be published immediately. We use build hooks to automatically deploy content updates as they're made, but static site generators also give us the flexibility to remove the build hooks and control when we refresh the content. This experience will inform how we iterate on our backend editing features in the future. What we do with the site after election day on November 3rd is still unknown. We're doing what we can to plan for a variety of scenarios and expect we'll need to add messaging where mail-in ballots are still being counted or races are being contested, but we're confident that we'll be able to easily adapt the site to handle this. Once the site is no longer needed, we're also making plans to archive it. In the past, many of our campaign sites remained up indefinitely, and it wasn't always clear whether we needed to continue maintaining them. I have to confess, we didn't get around taking to taking down the 2018 voting site until we were getting ready to launch the 2021. We're starting to create policies and procedures around archiving our sites so we can internally reference them for the parts we want to carry with us into new projects and don't have to worry about maintaining those parts we don't. With Let People Vote, we plan to export the final content as JSON so we can remove the editing interface from our core CMS. This will allow us to easily store and view the static site when needed for reference while eliminating the need to, back, to maintain a backup end that we will no longer be editing. The ease and speed with which we were able to build the site is thanks to the work of many current and former ACLU engineers and designers who have built and iterated on a growing set of tools, and most importantly, documentation. So I wanted to give them all a shout out. The best part of our stack is definitely the people and the dogs that make the cameos in our video meetings. You can learn more about making your voting plan at aclu.org voter. For more ways to get involved, check out the links in the slide. Thank you.